Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome President Microsoft, Brad Smith. It's a pleasure to be back here at RSA 14 months after the last RSA conference. It's an important moment for our industry. It's an important moment for cybersecurity. Last year was not the best year. As this news story from the BBC captured, 2017 could have been labeled Cybergeddon. But as you look at this headline, I think the question today is not what will 2018 bring to us, but what will we bring to 2018? What can we bring to improve the world? If we're going to make progress this year, I actually think it needs to start by learning from last year. Last year, as you heard, was a wake-up call, and I think that is precisely the right phrase. But unlike most years, it was a year where you could date the precise day of that wake-up call. It came on the morning of the 12th of May. It was a morning that started in Europe like many others, but as a cyber attack started in Spain and then the United Kingdom, as we now know, it literally spread around the world to 150 countries in a way like no attack had ever spread around the world before. But in some ways, even more than the 12th of May, we should be thinking about the 27th of June. Because on the 27th of June, there was an attack against a country, unlike any attack that a country had seen before. It sparked a time when we need to ask ourselves some new questions. In effect, we need to ask ourselves, what did that wake-up call tell us? We need to hear that call. We need to understand that call. We need to do all that if we're going to heed that call. And in some ways, it makes for a sobering time. Think about this. When World War II ended, the governments of the world came together and pledged that they not only had a moral responsibility, but a legal duty to protect civilians in times of war. But think about what happened on the 12th of May. Think about what happened on the 27th of June. We saw governments attacking civilians in a time of peace. As I've had the opportunity to travel the world and talk with people outside the cybersecurity community, outside the tech sector, and in the world of government, I've often found them saying, yeah, that's true. But it's not like this was an attack on people. It was just an attack on machines, right? If there is one message that we need to come together to convey to the governments of the world, it is this. No, that is not just an attack on machines. That is an attack that is endangering people's lives. We need to open the world's eyes to the impact these attacks are having so that we can rally the world to work with us to address it. In order to do that, we sent a team to Ukraine and to UK to talk with the people who were affected by those cyber attacks. Let me share with you what those days look like through their eyes. Я думаю, что наша страна находится в стадии войны, поэтому мы можем много что рассказать общественности, мировой общественности и показать все-таки лицо кибервойны. A global cyber attack. We've never seen anything on this scale. It can travel from computer to computer. Hospitals paralyzed, computers had shut down. Wanna cry is different. I think WannaCry is a great example of how nation states are impacting businesses and ultimately individuals as well. We had over 19,000 appointments cancelled and those are people who are worried about their um, cancer appointment or their appointment for an operation. 
was diagnosed with a heart murmur, which was the start of the hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. It's a very serious surgery. I wanted my life back. After I'd had my chest shaved at six o'clock in the morning, the doctor looked very, not upset, but concerned, shall we say, and he said, we've been hacked. Uh, all our systems are down across the whole hospital. He telephoned me, obviously, and said, it's not gonna happen, and he was, he was in shock. Suddenly we discovered that a bit of our society, a bit of our social infrastructure could be switched off. Wanna cry, it was a kind of a warning shot. The malware crippled computers across Ukraine. Perhaps the most sophisticated in a series of attacks taking control of computers and demanding digital ransom. The list of companies impacted around the world is growing. I think what NotPetya represents is not just the evolution of the attack in terms of the methodologies involved, but also the evolution of intent. Ну, чтобы понимать, что за два с половиной часа, десять часов утра, пол Украины уже было поражено. We have TV station who been on the air when their computers just died. You cannot receive cash in ATM machine because ATMs also were doesn't work. It was real shock for Kyiv citizens. Seventy-five percent of my clients were affected by Peter. Some companies were destroyed totally. They didn't understand why they're losing their job. Everybody is just thinking, we hope this will never happen again, but I'm afraid this will happen again. One of the objectives in the cyber attacks we face is disruption. To stop operating, to create significant burden to the life of the citizens, governments, businesses, where the cost of doing business or recovering is extremely high. In 2017, a lot was the same. Cyber attacks were happening, they were affecting organisations. What changed was the impact on our lives. It was the most awful time, because I didn't know what was going to happen now. Stop and think about what it means in real terms to real people. It isn't a machine you're affecting, and if it is, maybe that machine's keeping somebody alive. Ultimately, all of us pay the price when it comes to nations in particular who are attacking each other by using us as the means. What are we doing to come together? If we don't have this conversation now, when it happens and we all retreat behind walls, that is when this becomes a catastrophic event globally. And we need to do everything we can to at least talk about these issues before it happens. That is the call that we need to answer. It is, as we all know, a huge responsibility. Literally, we have a responsibility for the world. It is a responsibility that so clearly requires that each of us do more. And as you just heard, I think there are a lot of silver linings on which we can build. There has been a lot of progress over the last 14 months. There has been even progress over the last week. And one sees it across the industry. One sees it in new products as we look at the job that Apple has done to secure the phone with better, not just better encryption, but the ability for people to discard passwords and pins. We saw it just last night in new announcements by Intel to better secure the chip, including against the kinds of side attacks that we've witnessed over the last few months. We've seen it over the last six months from a company like Signal, which is helping to secure the directory of people's friends so that they can find other people without sharing their own contacts. Interestingly and importantly, it requires that we not only each do more, but that we each do more together. And if there's one thing that makes that so clear, it's this. It is the proliferation of IoT devices. It is the proliferation of devices powered by microcontroller units, MCUs. We are so rapidly entering a world with nine billion of these MCU devices shipped every year, we are so clearly gonna find ourselves walking into our homes in the future. And we're gonna be realizing that every child's toy 
every kitchen's refrigerator, every bedroom's thermostat, every automobile's controls is connected to the internet. It is a world that offers great promise, but in a world where everything is connected, then anything can be disrupted. And what that means for us is that everything needs to be protected, literally from the cloud all the way to the edge. That's why we at Microsoft announced here in San Francisco yesterday afternoon our new Azure Sphere IoT solution, something that brings together a new chip with a new operating system and a new security service. But what I think is in some ways most interesting about this is not only what it will do to secure potentially 9 billion devices, but the way that we and so many are working anew. We're taking the IP for the chip and licensing it to every chip maker on a royalty-free basis. We are building a new operating system that combines a custom Linux kernel with security advances pioneered in Windows. Did anyone think that anyone from Microsoft would ever come here and say that we are shipping a custom Linux kernel? And we are combining that with the Azure Sphere security service that will work not only with Azure and our data centers, but it will work with customers' legacy and new cloud services, whether it's from AWS or the Google Cloud or Oracle or IBM or Alibaba or you name it. In short, what it means is this. We have found a new way of working, a way of working that puts security first. And I think that is our goal as an industry. But if we're going to put security first in a way that will truly improve the world, we actually need to look beyond the technology itself. And that's where other important steps are rapidly emerging. It's why we at Microsoft just last week announced our Defending Democracy project. And you're going to see other projects from other companies. We already are. But it's a project with a new team that we have that will protect candidates, protect campaigns, protect voters, protect voting. That is what the world needs. And as we've talked to people across the industry, we've recognized that there is so much great expertise, there is so much important work in so many companies. What we need to do is find a new way to come together, to work together in a principled manner. When I spoke here last year, I said that one of the things the world needed was for our industry to come together and adopt a new tech accord that would put cybersecurity first. This morning, 34 companies across our industry did just that. We announced a new cybersecurity tech accord. And what this does is it commits us to four things. It commits us to protect all of our customers and all of our users everywhere, regardless of their circumstance. It commits us to oppose all cyber attacks by governments and others against innocent citizens and enterprises. It commits us to take new steps to work together to add to the resiliency and the capabilities across the ecosystem including with our customers that are the most vulnerable, oftentimes smaller businesses and nonprofits. And it commits us to partner together. It is what we said the world needs. It is what we said to the world we would do first. And now we come back and we can say that we are doing it. That is the kind of progress we need to make. We need not only to lead by example, we need to lead by using our voice. Because as we've all seen so clearly, we need governments to do more. We are living in a world where the most serious attacks are no longer by individuals or criminal groups, they are by nations. That is what 2017 showed us. But even there, as we're pushing for more progress by governments, we're starting to see some important results. On the 19th of December, there was an announcement attributing the WannaCry attack to a group connected with North Korea. 
That was not a news flash in and of itself. People in the industry had figured that out within a matter of hours. What was important was this. On that day, the governments of the United States and the United Kingdom and Japan and Canada and Australia and New Zealand united to make this attribution finding together. That was the first time that we've seen that kind of international collaboration. It is a sign of progress, but more importantly, it is a sign of the progress that still needs to come. It is the type of progress we're pushing to see more of. We're starting to see some movement. We're starting to see governments look at existing international laws and ask, how can we apply them? How can we strengthen them? How can we ensure that they put more pressure on other governments to stop attacking civilians? Think about what is in the news this morning. If ever there were yet another day when we should remind ourselves of what we need as a planet, it is a day like today. We need to remind ourselves of what every country pledged after World War II through the Geneva Convention, and we need to keep pushing the governments of the world for a new digital Geneva Convention. We need to get the governments of the world to agree that they will stop targeting tech companies. They will stop targeting the electrical grid. They will stop targeting the private sector. They will stop targeting hospitals. It's not only in times of war, but especially in times of peace. We need them to do even more to work with us so we can do even more to work with them to make the world a safer place. If you think about the expertise and knowledge in this room, I think that there are certain things that we've had the opportunity to experience, that you've had the opportunity to experience, that's ahead of the rest of the world. We recognize that we live in a new world. We're living amidst a generation of new weapons, and we're living in a world where cyberspace has become the new battlefield. Unquestionably, that gives to us, the companies and individuals across the tech sector, the first responsibility to keep people safe. You all, so many of you, have seen what this means firsthand after WannaCry or after NotPetya. See it through the eyes of this engineer, it was very creepy walking into a company um, just because there was no one about. Um, and then I got led up into a different area um, in, in the organization, basically where the IT floor was. And there was just people lying about on the, on the sofas asleep from where they've been absolutely throwing everything at whatever it is that, that, that the issue was. And at the time, I didn't really know either. You had people scrambling around, but there was no machines running. There was no telephones running. There was, there was no phone calls. You start to get the impression that um, it, it's like the company has died and, and all of the workforce are just kind of in this almost zombie state um, where they're just, uh, just not sure what to do or where to go from here. There have been days in the past year when many of you have literally helped bring companies back to life, have made a difference in people's lives. You all, we all, are literally the first responders on this new battlefield. But we also appreciate that it's not something that anyone can do alone. It is a shared responsibility across the tech sector and with our customers around the world. And whenever one is advancing a shared responsibility, one needs to start with shared values. In this instance, these shared values fundamentally come down to many things, but in some ways, it comes down to one thing, one word. It's about trust between governments. It's about trust between individuals. It's about trust between governments and companies. And that is what we're lacking in the political will of the current atmosphere. The interesting thing when you think about trust is that there's a huge shortage of it between countries and governments today. But at the same time, we find it in our industry, in our ability to bring people together from around the world. More than ever, we need to bring everyone together. 
We need to bring together the best ideas that everyone has. That, as much as anything else, is what we're going to need to do to make progress. Cybersecurity is a global problem. It's changing and evolving. There's no other problem I can think of where you want to have a wide variety of people who think differently and a very diverse and inclusive set of people who are working together to solve that problem. This is a problem the world needs us to help solve. Through our expertise, through our ability to use our voice, through our ability to work together, ultimately through our ability to learn, to grow, to become more diverse, to become more inclusive, to change. We can do all of that. And if we do all of that, we can make 2018 a year where we help to build a safer world. Thank you very much.